Welcome, everybody, to the Ukulele Video Play Along Podcast. I'm Crystal, Chris Russell, and with me today is Dr. Jill Reese from the State University of New York in Fredonia. So, Dr. Reese, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do at uh, SUNY Fredonia. Great. Well, uh, you did a good job introducing me because that's who I am already. Um, I teach the sort of general music stuff at Fredonia. Um, so I teach, uh, I've taught a lot of classes there since starting in 2011. Um, I've taught like the child development course that we have for music education majors. Hello. That's all right. It's my phone going off. Sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. I don't even know where my phone is. So I'm wondering when that's going to go off. Um, and I've taught like the psychology and sociology of music education for music education majors. And the cool thing is that at Fredonia, um, they don't take any classes in the College of Education. All of their like education courses are taught by music education professors, which is kind of cool. Um, so we, they don't have to, um, you know, sit in classes where they're wondering how does this apply to music. Um, we help them make those connections right away, which is cool. And also, the great thing is that um, because our professors teach those courses, we can make connections to, um, throughout their curriculum for them, which is fun. Um, so the classes that I teach now, so that was, I sort of have taught all these different courses, but the ones that I focus on now are um, the elementary general music methods course, and I teach an early childhood um, pedagogy course, and I teach research methods for graduate students, you know, sort of things like that. Um, I've also taught the secondary general music methods course, but our program at Fredonia is so large that, um, <laughs> that we, we have so many professors here. So at five, we have 5,000 undergraduates at Fredonia. So it's wow. kind of a smaller university. Um, however, 10% of those students are music majors. So one out of every 10 students on campus is, is majoring in music of some sort, um, which is really cool. So we have a large school of music at a small university, which is um, creates a really great community. And 300 on, so I'm kind of giving you average numbers, but about 300 of those 500 music majors are music education majors. Oh, wow. So yeah, so it's a huge program, um, which means every semester I get the chance to teach two sections of elementary general music and this great course, early childhood music pedagogy, where for 10 weeks out of the semester, they're in daycare centers or teaching parent child music classes, that sort of thing. So they get to be the teachers. And it's so much fun to see their um, identities as music educators um, blossom. So I'm really lucky at Fredonia. It's a, it's a great community and um, we have wonderful students. So I'm lucky to be where I am. This is the only university position I've ever had. Um, with I did a little bit of adjunct teaching while I was a classroom music teacher, but since uh, getting my PhD, this is the only job I've had, and I love it. What did you do before you were at Fredonia? What uh, what general or you know music teacher jobs did you have before that? Well, I taught in a, a small rural district in Michigan. Um, called Langsburg. That was my first job, and I taught um, high school choir and elementary general music. I'm I'm actually a percussionist, so um, yep. it's, a, it's a little. That was my main um, instrument. My primary instrument was percussion, um, but I knew straight off when I started. Um, I started as a performance major in percussion, but um, ended up switching to education when. I picked my sister up at school. Now, I had never had general music growing up. Um, I went to a Catholic school and we didn't have that. We just sort of started band in fourth grade. And I'm a huge quitter. So I started um, <laughs> clarinet in fourth grade and I did that for half of a year. And because I'd already been taking piano since I was five, I could read music. And so the pace of instruction was really slow and I got bored. So I said halfway through the year after the Christmas concert, I switched to trumpet much to the chagrin of my parents who made me practice in the basement. So I did <laughs> trumpet for um, the rest of fourth grade. And then I switched to a public school in fifth grade and I did flute for a year and I quit again because I felt dizzy at the end of each rehearsal. And you know, that band director was like, oh, just stick with it. And I was like, nah, I don't like this. Um, and then so I switched to percussion. But um, I, this is how I remember it. It probably wasn't this way, but um, I just remember that the band director had me on the bells all the time. I really want to play drums, but 
Um, he had me on bells the whole time. This is, again, how I remember it. it may not be the way it was um, because I could read music. Um, and so that's where he put me. And I thought, this is ridiculous. I just want to play drums. So I quit again. And I did home mech and all those fun classes in junior high. And then in high school, I wanted to be um, in with the marching band kids because my older sister, who had just graduated from high school, all of her friends were marching band. So I went to the band director and I said, you know, I really want to be in marching band. And he said, we don't march piano, makes sense. So he said, but these xylophones and, you know, marimbas, they're a lot like piano. So try those out, you know, read, read this piece of music and we'll see how you do. And I thought reading one line, that's like so simple, you know? So, so I read it down and um, he was very smart. He said, you can't just be in marching band. You have to you know, be in the concert band. So let's put you in the percussion section again. Um, so, you know, I, but I kind of came about it in a backward way. And I only took lessons my senior year of high school. And I, the way I remember it is I learned very little literature. I had to prepare for auditions because someone said, um, one of the marching band instructors said, um, have you ever thought about being a music major? I don't usually, you know, suggest this to people because it's not a very good lifestyle. That right there intrigued me, right? So, um, so, and I didn't know that people majored in music. Uh, my dad worked for Chrysler and still does. Um, so kind of blue collar, didn't graduate from college. Um, my mom had uh, started going to a four-year college, but then dropped out and um, ended up, you know, getting married and having family and then went to school to be an RN. So she went to a, like a two-year college. So I didn't even know what people majored in when they went to college. So um, when he said uh, people major in music, I thought, well, that'd be really cool. And I just really wanted to play John Williams scores. That's all I wanted to do for the rest of my life. So I thought, oh yeah, I'll, I'll major in performance. So major in performance. And then at the end of the first year, I felt um, extremely depressed. And I think it was because I wasn't really interacting with people in a way that was satisfying for me. So I picked my sister up. This is all a long story to say. I picked my no, sister it's okay. up at school. Um, and she, I picked her up early. I got there early and she was in music class. Now, again, back to the beginning of the story, I never had general music before because I went to Catholic school and we just started band in fourth grade. So I went into her class. Um, the principal said, why don't you go in um, and watch music class? So I went in and I saw um, Sue Cones who I attribute my entire um, career to basically. It's a turning point for me. I went in there and um, she had all these little xylophones out. And as a percussion major, I thought, oh my gosh. And the children were moving so musically. So she was using the ORF approach. And I thought, this is amazing. I am going to create an army of tiny percussionists. And that was my main goal. I was like, you know, I'm going to become a music teacher and I'm going to just make all these little percussionists who I, like love music. That, that's my, my life's goal. So luckily I was at Michigan State University where um, Cindy Taggart and John Kratis, gosh, so many people, um, John Reed and Cora, I mean, um, Cindy Palak, so many great people. And I didn't know how lucky I was to be there. It was serendipitous that I was at this amazing juggernaut of a school for music education. So I switched to music ed, um, pursued a bit of the um, ORF approach, ended up getting certified. Um, and I also, they at Michigan State, they do something called music learning theory. Um, and so I ended up getting certified in music learning theory too. So that was sort of the end of the beginning for me. Um, Cindy Taggart is amazing um, when it comes to early childhood music, especially. Um, and I observed these early childhood music classes where the infants and toddlers were so naturally musical already. And um, I just thought, this is not what I had imagined, but uh, my goal is to like help people birth to earth. Now my goal is not to create an army of tiny percussionists. While that could happen, but um, <laughs> my, my goal is to sort of support um, music engagement, birth to earth, you know? And I hadn't even like, the early childhood stuff, elementary general music, that was a huge draw for me. But now that I'm at the college level and working, and we'll probably talk more about this, with a community ukulele group, um, I, I realize how important post K-12, pre-K-12 um, music engagement is. And I think we don't often prepare 
um, music teachers to um, create opportunities beyond, you know, high school. And man, everybody's so busy. Music teachers are so busy. So I can't even imagine, like, I know what it's like to do programs and things like that, that you're not paid for. And <laughs> that, you know, it's, you're never really, um, you know, you don't get besides the thank yous from parents and students, you know, there's, there's not that, you know, especially for elementary general music teachers, there's often not that, um, like a stipend or something for what you do. Um, not that that really matters, but, um, you know, we, you're so busy that, you know, gosh, to think of creating these community music opportunities beyond the school day is probably overwhelming, but, but I think that should be part of our mission because we're only perpetuating this if we're only preparing students essentially for the high school ensembles and not for life beyond that, not creating opportunities beyond that, you know, is that really ethical? Um, are we just perpetuating our own jobs? And, and if so, again, like what are the ethics of that? So, um, so I try to help my students understand that, you know, we are musical before we get to school um, and hopefully school doesn't um, beat that out of us. Because mm -hmm. for so long, oh, yeah. School music programs, essentially, what many students learn from school music programs is some people do music and some people don't. Um, so part of ukulele is this opportunity to do music that isn't um, the band, orchestra, choir stuff that, you know, statistically, I mean, the the usual statistic is 80% of students don't, you know, participate in school music ensembles, traditional ensembles. So it's really important for us to help provide these opportunities. And ukulele is a really wonderful tool to engage people outside of the traditional band orchestra choir stuff. So uh, I don't know if I answered your question, but so that's, that's a little bit about me and my ethos and how I've gotten to this point, I guess. Now that's really that's really wonderful. I, I have felt the same thing. I've never really put it in those terms. But the first time that I went to a community ukulele group, um, it was after I had picked up the ukulele just to teach because I was looking for something to fill this middle part of the year. And I walked into this group, and here are these people that are generally 50 to 70 years old because they meet during the day. And who else can meet during the day other than if you're retired, right? So, And, and as a music teacher, the only time that I can ever do these things are either in the summer when I'm not working or on a day that we have off, like I'm on spring break right now, so I'll be able to go on Friday. But here I'm watching these people that have not participated in music since maybe middle school. And they're picking up ukuleles and they're singing, some of them are singing at least, and they're singing and they're having a great time and they're at all different levels of whatever. And I'm sitting there as a music teacher and again, the older I get, and again, I think it's the higher education thing starts to drive it out of us too. Um, the more education you get, the more you know, and the more it kind of resets you. But, you know, the idea of pure, and I'm, I'm a choral person, I'm a band person, I'm a tuba player, I'm a I'm an operatic tenor. Um, I totally get performing groups in high school and college. I get it. I love them. I love them to death. But we aren't serving so many people. And, and the people that are teaching those courses don't want to add anything else to their plates generally. You know what I mean? They're like, they, well, they can't, maybe they would like to, but yeah, you know, there's just so much. I don't know. I've, I've been in too many programs where I've started other things. Like I've started other kinds of classes. And the second I leave the people that follow me kill those classes immediately. Mm -hmm. So, and that's everything from music theory to like guitar to you name it. So I, I think there's just, we weren't taught to be those teachers. That wasn't when I went into school to become, so therefore I don't want to teach those courses. I think that all, because so anyway, but when I saw that and these people that were just loving music, I sat back and thought, what is our purpose as music educators? Mm -hmm. And it's really not for that. I mean, I'm watching all these tweets on, or not tweets, but Facebook posts by all these people doing contests right now that are posting their results. And it's like, yeah, that's a cool part of what we do, but that's really not what we're supposed to be doing. So if people... Well you know? it, fits, it, it serves a purpose and it um, fulfills a need. Some people need and want that, you know, like, like think of us. I mean, that that's something that drew us performance, something that drew us in. Um, but it, but there's more to it, yeah. you know? Yeah. So, and I'm not saying it's bad either. It's just, mm -hmm. it's just, but that's the ending point for so many people. Yeah. And really there's that, just like you said before, 
education. And then what about all the stuff after? So I don't know. I just, you're just, I don't know. You're, you're really hitting me with that, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, and then Tom Torino, there's this um, great, I don't know what do you call him, academic researcher, um, philosopher, possibly. Um, Tom Torino um, describes different ways of engaging with music. And one way is performative engagement. And another um, way that he describes is participatory engagement. And there are other ways. But um, but I think of those two often when I think of music education contexts. And so often, I mean, you mentioned like there's this end result or this performance or the product. Um, and a lot of what we do is product based. And that makes sense because how else do parents and administrators know what we're doing if there isn't this product, right? Um, so much of education is product based. And that that's so unfortunate. And that I think that's some of the challenges, the big picture challenges with education in general at this point is there's this outcome and yes there need to be outcomes but the, there's the learning process is so much more important and to value the process of learning as opposed to the outcome so the journey um, is really important and um, and I think so, a lot of what we have the opportunity to do in general music context is to value that process even a bit more um, so, so a lot of what has come into my purview is this idea of um, participatory engagement. And um, so if you have the opportunity to read um, some of Thomas Torino's stuff about um, performative engagement, participatory engagement, um, I encourage all of you to do that because it's, um, it might kind of tweak your perspective a little bit, or you might say like, ah, this is what I've been thinking the whole time, you know, but it, um, it's really interesting. And there's, um, information about how flow, um, chick sent my highs. Um, I don't know if I'm saying that right, but that's one way <laughs> I've heard it pronounced. Um, um, hi, chick sent my highs, um, research about flow. Um, so Tom Torino's stuff kind of overlaps with that. And boy, if we can create flow context within our classrooms, I mean, that, that really keeps the students coming back. It helps them, um, perceive a value in what they're doing and, um, and even contributes to their musician identity in some ways, but maybe we'll get to that. Who knows? But um, anyway, so so I encourage you to read some of his stuff. Participatory engagement, performative engagement. Those By Tom Torino. Yeah, Tom Torino. T U R I N O. <laughs> Love it. Want to look it up. Um, I was going to ask you. So it sounds like you came from Michigan. That's where you're. Yeah home yep. state is. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I came from Wisconsin, so, you know, similar, um, Midwestern state. Mm -hmm. And I would guess that as you grew up, you did not have ukulele in your background at all. Is that true? That is true. Um, as a matter of fact, and I can't remember what year it was, but it was before I started my doctoral studies, um, maybe 2005 or so. I opened, um, someone that I knew had gone from being a band director to um, being a general music teacher. I look, as a, I look at that like as an opportunity, but I'm not <laughs> sure that's how he looked at it. Um, but I was helping him set up the, the classroom and I opened up this closet and I saw these tiny guitars and I thought, whose idea was this? Because as soon as you tune them, they're out of tune again. This is ridiculous and I closed the door. Um, I closed the door on a great opportunity and um, and didn't look back for a while. When I was an undergrad, um, <laughs> I remember, and again, I don't know if this is just what I perceive of what happened or, or this is really true, but someone said um, mariachi bands. Mariachi bands are the wave of the future and you better learn how to you know play all the instruments of a mariachi band because that is sweeping the nation. Um, and I'm not sure that really took hold <laughs> beyond the Southwest. Um, in some communities, I think I think it did. Like we have a um, a large um, Latino population out, um, oddly enough, in Western New York in um, Dunkirk. So I think I think that I would really take hold in certain communities. But it never really did when I was a practicing teacher. Um, and ukuleles really weren't on the radar then. Um, but, and I think that's one of your questions you're thinking of asking is like, how did I get to ukulele? Um, so I took this 
I had tried to play guitar and I had a guitar when I was a practicing music teacher and I learned two chords, basically the G chord and what else would help that one? D. Yeah, or and, D7, yeah, either one. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so it was like, you know, you could play a whole host of tunes with just those two chords, great, and that's all I did and I never learned any more beyond that. I don't even think that was part of my, um, we didn't, I don't think we had a guitar course that we had to really? take as um, an undergrad. Um, my undergrad experience was amazing at Michigan State, uh, but a little, I think back then you chose instrumental or choral general. Okay. So I was this percussionist that tried to fit into the choral general track. And so I took voice classes for the voice majors and voice classes for the non-voice majors. I tested out a piano. Um, so it was just kind of an odd, I think I had an odd pathway, but, but I never had to learn guitar. And, um, so I get to this university position, really hating guitar and never having learned how to play it. And, and I thought, gosh, they're going to make, they're going to expect me to play something, right? Some stringed accompaniment instrument. And my friend said, just pick up a baritone ukulele because it's the top four strings of a guitar, four strings easier than six strings. And, um, and you, and it'll look like a guitar on you because I'm kind of a petite person. So they said, that'll be fine. You can snow them with that. So I thought, great. Um, so I picked up a baritone ukulele, um, I think maybe my second year, so 2012 or so, and um, and played that a bit. And I thought, oh, this is fine, but I'll never use a ukulele, like a soprano ukulele. It sounds terrible. Um, it, it doesn't sound like a real instrument. It sounds like a toy. Well, that... Um, that came and went because now I have seven ukuleles um, and some of them, uh, many of them are, are not baritones. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of how I came to it because I didn't want to play guitar. My joke is always that, um, and I'm gonna say it here and now people are gonna watch this and it's gonna be not a useful joke anymore uh, when I do workshops. <laughs> but my joke is um, guitar is made high aliens for aliens because you need seven fingers to play it. But ukulele is made for humans by humans because you only need five fingers to play it. So, um, so that's my joke, but, um, but it's just such a more accessible instrument. I think if you start there and then transition to guitar, I think that would be a really um, good transition. I don't know that I'm going to make that transition because I tried just like two years ago, I bought, um, a smaller size guitar because I thought, well, maybe it's the size of the guitar that really um, is getting me. But, um, but it just, it was like um, a folk. Mm, that's probably not right. Anyway, it was a certain kind of guitar and, um, and I had it for an entire six months and I didn't touch it. Um, and I sold it because I thought, well, maybe it's for some and not for others. So I tried guitar again. And it's not for me. No, I'm with you. I have a few guitars around the house. I've got a jam stick. I don't know if you've seen the jam stick. Um, it's this. I think I've heard of it. Yeah, it's this. Um, it's a Bluetooth wireless Bluetooth uh, controller that you can play guitar through your PC, your Mac, your I iOS. They, they are here in Minnesota. I keep talking to them about making a uh, ukulele stick, and it's it's on their their product map maybe. So they're working on it. But <laughs> but just guitar just isn't my thing. And the other side is not only do you have that, but generally you have metal strings, so mm -hmm. that makes it a little more difficult to play. And then the string spacing is so close mm -hmm. compared to a ukulele. So not only do you have to have actually, you know cover six strings, but you also have to deal with strings that are closer together, which, you know, in the ukulele world, we freak out when strings are closer together. We're like, we need more space. And it's like, how do guitar players do it? So, and, and then you watch these guys that actually can play anything, you know, like the Roy Smex of the old days, or, or even the people like out in uh, Hawaii that are just, they drop a ukulele and pick up a guitar. And it's like, what are you, are you kidding me? But you know, that's kind of fun. Now, how did you go about then going from playing ukulele. So it sounds like you picked up baritone ukulele while you're at Fredonia. Is that right? Right. So then how do you go to suddenly then it was the Fredonia ukulele group next? Was that the next piece? Or um, what, what was yeah. the transition or was it working with students and having them pick it up? How did it snowball to the next step? That's a good question. So I, we, have the opportunity to apply for grant funding um, 
at Fredonia. So instructional incentive grants. And so I thought, well, I'm going to apply for a grant for 20 ukuleles because um, that was about like the chunk of money. So as part of the grant, you have to say how you're going to use them. And so what I did is I said, I'm going to write this grant. And if I get them, I'll use them in my methods courses, my secondary general music methods course that I that I used to teach, but I don't anymore right now. Um, and my elementary general music methods course. And on top of that, because I uh, I should bite off small pieces, but I don't, I never do. And so, <laughs> um, so I said, on top of that, I'm going to start a community ukulele group. And um, through that, I am going to also do some research because Jill, why not try to do everything? Um, so that's what I said I was going to do. And um, I, so they said, sure, here's, here's the money for 20 ukuleles. I bought the 20 ukuleles. Um, and then I, I think, I think this is the way it went that I bought the ukuleles. I ended up using them. So that was January and I'm using them in my methods classes. And one reason I wanted to start a community group is because I enjoy playing ukulele, but I kind of wanted to play it with other people. Like being with other people is, um, and interacting with folks is, um, important for me. I, I get some energy from that. So, um, None of my friends wanted to play ukulele with me. Like, I've had a lot of musician friends, but nobody wanted to play with me. So if your friends don't want to play ukulele with you, I encourage you to find other friends. So that's what I did. I put an ad in the paper and I pretended like there was this already established community group. So I had these ukuleles. I said I was going to do a ukulele group. And so March 2015 was our first Fredonia ukulele meeting and i just put an ad in the paper that said fredonia ukulele community group meeting you know on friday the last friday of the month 6 p.m at this cafe um you don't need a ukulele we have some right so just join us you don't even need to know how to use a ukulele um so i put that ad in the paper and i can't even remember how many people came to that i and but since then i mean i, I could look and see because um for the first couple of years i was keeping track of how many people and who came like their names and i would check them off like they came this <laughs> month they didn't come this month that sort of thing um and then after a while i was just like oh i forget about i'm not keeping track of that um but uh so a handful of people came and I didn't know what it was supposed to be because I'd never been to any other group. Boy, Jill, that would have been a smart thing to do. Go to somebody else's group, you know, find another group. But um, but I didn't. So I just thought, okay, so I'll run it sort of like a class, like a ukulele class sort of thing. So I had um, a PowerPoint projector. We projected on the wall. I had audio, um, like through my iPad and... Um, yeah, I think just through my iPad. And I had um, projected on the wall just the song chart. Basically, it's like the lyrics with the letter name of the chord above it. And then I had um, uh, pieces of paper, the pictures of the chords with the names. Okay, so that was that was my what I pre did prepared for my first meeting. And I had tunes that I thought would be fun to do. Well, okay, so what I ended up doing that entire meeting was um, with the laser pointer pointing along to the lyrics and when the chords changed and singing along and really doing a lot of guiding, which is fine. But what was my purpose for starting this group? So that I could play with other people. What wasn't I doing? Playing with other people. It was, it felt more like being a teacher and I didn't, I didn't want to be a teacher. I wanted to be like a, someone who played along with other people. I want to be a group. So um, that is where I thought, how can I point along to the chords, have the lyrics. And what I, what I realized is it did not with like, what did we have? Like a half dozen people, maybe like six people at this first meeting. It felt so exposed to sing and have not very full strumming underneath the tunes that we tried to do without the recording. So I thought, okay, this is what we need. We need to sort of have sound to fill us up so people don't feel scared to sing or play out, or even if they're not, if they're just strumming one strum, it still feels filled out. I also need something that 
points to the cord so I'm not using a laser pointer. So I thought, how am I gonna create this? And that's when I created my first ukulele play along video um, because because I, I selfishly wanted to play with other people. But what I also realized is that um, the, the videos serve a larger purpose. Um, and I've done a little bit of research on this, like actual research. And I have a, a research study that is in prog. Well, I have one that's, oh gosh, I've got so much. Oh, like two that are in progress, but one right now that is um, in process of um, being reviewed for publication. But I, I think I can talk about that a little bit. But the videos for teachers, the videos help because, and you can probably speak to this, and the people who are watching can probably agree and even tell me more of how they help. But I mean, you can, when you're not pointing along, you can look at your students and see what they're doing and assess them and support them. And um, they really do, there are so many benefits. Um, there are some drawbacks as well, but um, there are a lot of benefits. So um, uh, anyway, so so that's that's one reason that I made them was because I wanted to play along with other people, but I realized there were pedagogical benefits beyond that, beyond my selfish need to play with other people. Now, when you have those published, will you let us know that you've that they're published and where they're published? Sure. Because those would definitely... be interesting studies, for, at least for me to read. I don't know about other people because... I mean, by the way, if anybody else ever reads, you know, music ed research, the, the real spot that you really want to focus for most people is probably that entire first introduction is probably the safe place to stay for a lot of people because there you'll get the conclusion, you'll get the main point. And then if you're interested in further stuff, then you can go further in that. But, but yeah, yeah, so there's, there's typically like a 250 word abstract. And so you can read that and sort of get a flavor of what... You, you might read further. And then the next part is a literature review. And that mm -hmm. is basically what, what we know before taking part in doing this study. And then the researcher describes what they did as part of the study, which might be interesting. And then um, the results, depending on the study, um, will be easier or, or more difficult to read. Um, and then the discussion and kind of conclusion at the end, sort of what this means. Um, for practicing teachers will be sort of at the end. So um, the stuff that's more difficult to get through, if there's statistics, just kind of scan it um, if you're a beginning reader of research. However, um, I might suggest, especially if you're interested in um, putting together a community group of your own, um, is reading uh, Robin Giebelhausen, I'm sure that's a name you've heard, um, and I think it's Adam Cruzy, have, They've done a study about, um, I think they compared five different um, community ukulele groups, four or five different community ukulele groups. They looked at the facilitators and um, sort of their role and um, their goals and things like that. So that's a pretty good study to look at. Um, I'm trying to remember where that was in, maybe um, music education research. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take I'll a look for it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Or if you don't get out, I'll, I'll dig it out one way. I didn't know that Robin had done done mm -hmm. that. Now I'm going to come back to Robin in a second. Um, what I, I also wanted to ask you is so that it looks like, I don't know if your channel has changed since you created or, or if you started making videos before you started uploading them to YouTube, mm -hmm. but it looked like your first video was um, Shake It Off. Is, is that right? Was that the mm -hmm. first one that you made? I think that was the first video that I made and um, funny story about that video. So the first time I made um, a video, I made it sort of for what I thought would work. Um, and I brought it to the ukulele group. And what I did was the first time, <laughs> the first time the first chord would come up and then it would disappear. And then the second chord would come up and disappear. And then the third chord would come up and disappear. Okay. So I did not have like the progression wasn't out there. And at the end, and I thought like, oh, this is such great boo. This can be so helpful. And at the end, people were angry, <laughs> which is a clear indication that something didn't work. Um, and uh, Joe, there's a member of my community ukulele group who um, does um, we have contra dancing or old timey sort of square folk dancing in our community. It's such a great community to be part of. Man, I love Fredonia. Um, 
And so he had a lot of advice for me and he still does. At the end of every jam session he comes to, he will email me suggestions about what I can do to improve, which I appreciate. Um, I do. And um, because I know it comes from his a good heart. place. Yeah. You know, a place yes. where he wants. And and I have learned a lot from him, but he was angry at the end of this video. He's like, I don't know what's coming next, and there's not enough time for this and that. So I was like, okay. So I, I had to like I, I learned from the feedback that I got from people. I also learned, I know this is maybe something you're gonna ask, is um Kevin Way is part of um, the Fredonia community. He is a great music teacher at um in the Fredonia Central School District here. And um, he is just such a wonderful person and great musician, creates an amazing um, environment for his students or context for his students to explore making music. And he focuses on the middle school um, age group. So, um, so he's great. Um, and he, I sort of brought my students in to do field teaching in his classroom and we were I said can we do ukulele sure we do a little bit of ukulele stuff and so and since then he's um, grown to do even more with his students and create these videos and he would say like oh yeah those videos are great so I thought I would create my own so I did it this way and I was like oh next chord that's a great idea and so he put next chord with the letter name of the chord and I thought that's a great idea but the community members in my group will say D minor, what's D minor? And so they will, oh, my dog's in the room too. <laughs> and so um, they, so I thought, okay, I think it'd be even more helpful if they saw the picture of the chord, not just the D minor. So one of the first videos, I think I added the next chord or next, whatever's coming next was my girl. And that does only have the letter, like um, what comes next? C, G, whatever is the progression. Um, and, and after doing that, I got the feedback of like, oh, we need to see the pictures. Okay, fine, pictures. So then I ended up putting the picture of the next chord in it. Um, so that, so I have, I've learned from watching um, all of your videos too, sort of what works and what doesn't work. And, um, and people, again, from, from a place of love, people will send me comments on my, <laughs> the YouTube videos. And some of them are really great. Some of them are like, oh, I just love when people are like, um, I'm in sixth grade and we're using this song um, for our concert. You know, thanks for making this video. I can play so much better now. And I'm like, oh, I don't play well. so those comments are great. Some people are like, this video sucks. And I'm like, mm, delete. Um, and that's fine. <laughs> I know there are trolls out there. Um, and, and some people say, will say like, what's the strumming pattern? Yes. I, I get that one all the time. And so on videos where I don't put a strumming pattern, I might put it in the comments. Um, and sometimes I just don't um, because cause strum patterns can vary. Um, and I and I also I just think like how much hand holding. Part of me says like the sarcastic person to me is like, OK, and also remember, inhale and exhale while you're playing. You know, do I have to put that much detail? Um, so and I also think like I've got a full time job. <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> I can't just do this. Like you are amazing. You are prolific and in, in the videos that that you do, Chris, but in the number of videos you do, I, I just can't with all the things that are part of my job. Um, I feel like sometimes I have to draw a line with how many I make. And oh, no, um, I, I you hear know, you. I hear you That sort of thing. But um, Anyway, so yeah, so I've learned a lot and I, I appreciate the feedback to someone, a public school teacher, I think in New York City said, hey, Jill, great video um, recently of um, best day, best day of my life. However, I think the chord progression is wrong. Would you ever consider um, doing it this way with, with these chords? And I was like, oh yeah, I would totally consider that. Thanks. And I you know redid the video. Um, so, so there are times when I would consider redoing a video and times when I'm like, um, you're right. And I am not going to redo that one <laughs> right now. I just can't redo that one. So, um, you know, and you've, you've meant, you've made comments about that on the Facebook page too. Like, you know, there's a point where I'm just not going to redo an old video. It is what it is and use it or don't use it and have a great day. Well, I also appreciate when you've even contacted me and said, you know, Chris, I'm not quite sure that's the right <laughs> sequence. And I go, yeah, you're right. Because sometimes what you're also hearing in the moment changes later, yes. too. Yes. yes so, yes, yes. you know, and it's kind of fun just to think 
how we all go about it. It sounds like in, when you were discussing with Julia Priest, and I've never met her, so I, I don't know her directly, but you were telling her to listen to the bass line when she's doing her analysis of what chords to play. And I was thinking, man, I almost never listen to the bass line. I'm just listening to the overall chords as a whole. I don't know why, but it's kind of, it's, did, did you have some bass experience in your life or something? I was just kind of curious. No, um, and the bass line is, is a good place to start, but there are like inversions. So, you know, yeah. it, it's not always what you think it is um, or what the baseline is. Uh, no, I didn't have that, but and, uh, my music learning theory background. Um, so I don't know how much folks know about music learning theory. There are a lot of um, ideas out there about what music learning theory is and what it isn't. And I would encourage you to find out for yourself. Um, but part of what music learning teacher, music learning theory teachers do is they have their students sing the chord root melody for a song. So, um, you know, if the song is Polly Wally Doodle. Oh, I went down south for to see myself singing Polly Wally Doodle all the day. So you've got tonic, 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 dominant, you know, so there's this like harmonic um, rhythm, I guess you could say that sort of mm -hmm. moves throughout that song. And I think being able to figure that out is super important. Um, we were, we're talking about the benefits and the drawbacks of these videos. Well, the benefit is you've given the students everything. Um, the drawback is what happens when they are on their own or they have a song that they need to figure out you know, the chords for themselves. Well, if you're giving them everything, then they, you know, like you're giving them the fish, you're not teaching them how to fish. Those of you who have any, you know, Bible background, you know, that's, it's, <laughs> you, you, need, you need to teach them the skills so they can do it themselves. So um, the videos are great. However, I would encourage you to have your students sing the chord roots. So um, so they are not just pushing buttons, but they are hearing and their voice is so much more closely connected to their musical thinking than their fingers are. I mean, literally their fingers are further away from their brain, their musical thinker. Um, so I would encourage you to have them sing the chord roots. Um, some people even have their students play the chord roots on orf instruments. So they can sort of hear that root rhythm. Um, and, and I think part of that was, for me, is playing piano. So I didn't just play a melodic instrument. I played an instrument that had melody and harmony. And so that, and I had to figure out, because part of my um, musical training, I would be given a melody and told, figure out what chords go underneath it, you know, so that that was helpful too. And then again, playing timpani, being a percussionist and playing timpani, you are playing chord roots <laughs> most of the time, you know? So um, so hearing that harmonic rhythm is a skill that you can develop. But the question is, how do you develop that? And um, part of that, I think, is seeing the chord root melody. So if you're a teacher and you're having trouble figuring out um, developing that skill, your music teacher, whoever you are, a, a grown up somewhere, or a child, um, you know, you've got, Often, often, but not always, those um, song sheets with the chords over the lyrics, just play that letter name of the chord on piano or on whatever instrument you can grab a hold of. So you can hear sort of that harmonic rhythm that goes underneath it. Um, I think that is really helpful. In my general music classes, the students will, um, like I'll, as soon as, um, they can sing the song. I will teach them the chord roots that go underneath it so they can essentially sing in parts. I mean, why not? That's great for beginning part singing. Right, right. And if they can hear that chord root underneath, they can sing the melody so much more in tune because they're hearing the melody in relationship to the harmony all the time. I mean, that's that's really what we want is for them to not just hear the horizontal hear music horizontally, but we want them to hear it vertically, vertically. as well. Yeah. So I don't know, if, I can't even remember how we started on that. Um, well, I was, I was just asking, you know, in terms of like with Julie, where you were suggesting that she listened to the bass mm -hmm. line. And as you were talking, I was realizing, you know, as a tuba player, that just might be inherently coming to me naturally That's without right. without even thinking about it. 
because that's all we ever played was that, you know, yeah. the corn root or the corn low inversion or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. um, I saw a hilarious post the other day about, um, I can't remember what the what the composer was, but it was uh, for, for string bass. It was an entire page of just holding one note. I can't remember what the score was. And I was like, yeah, I've seen that too as a tuba player. You run out of, talk about getting dizzy when you play. When you have an entire page of just holding notes, that's as a tuba player. And it's also fun to watch flute players learn how to play tuba as a music, you know, as an instrumental music major. Because yeah. even the flute players are like, I can, I can breathe forever. Mm -mm. <laughs> Here's my tuba. Try that. So, well, um, try, playing, try playing tacit for an entire piece. Well, I mean, if, that's yeah, if you don't breathe, <laughs> if you don't breathe, that's really dangerous. Yeah, yeah. that's true. That's true. Um, so, uh, so here's my a couple of questions. I don't want to forget where I'm going with this. So the first one is about your ukulele group that you're with. Um, first question would be is, are you still using the videos with them? Or are they using like the yellow book, blue book at this point? And um, how many people are involved there now is be my first question there. Those are all great questions. Um, yes, we are still using the play along videos. Um, we typically have two jam sessions a month. We have a um, community jam on the last Friday of the month where we do beginners and brush up for the first half hour or so. So I sort of treat it like, here's how you hold a ukulele. Okay. Um, and so we have some regulars who will come in like a half an hour late to that meeting. Good luck finding a seat. Um, but that's, that's how that goes. And then about a year into doing the community group, I had some people say like, this is good, but was really slow at the beginning and I said okay well why don't we do another jam session on the second Friday of the month that has we'll call it the b-side jam like the b-side of a record you know okay so I'll call it the b-side jam and or, and it's also like beside right beside, oh I get it beside that you know we'll do it so um so I thought long and hard about the name so um so that one I said fine. You don't want beginners and brush up. We are just going to hit the ground running and we're going to do um, some picking as part of that, et cetera, et cetera. And so there, you know, I do more of the difficult bar chords and, and all that. So um, that was meant as, as sort of like an advanced jam. Um, so that's how those sort of evolved. And we started with about a half dozen people at the first um, ukulele group meeting. And we've gone up to about 45 people within a jam, but wow. they oscillate between um, 25 and 35 people at each meeting. Um, and we have a blend of like college students, some children who might come with their parents, some local high school, middle school students whose teachers have said, you know, why don't you check that out? Um, all the way through retirees. So um, we've got a really, intergenerational group but it, it's that's part of the fun of it so now flip-flop on to that I, some of your students have also been making the play along videos at various <laughs> times over the last few years uh -huh. when did you bring that to your students to have them start making their own content because it sounds like a great homework project Doesn't well, how, it? <laughs> how did they how did they react to it and, and that's you know kind of question you know yeah um so when I was teaching the secondary general music methods course, that was something that, that was an assignment that I gave them. Um, I wanted them to, like the first time I had them make a video of any sort was um, I had them create, and this, this idea I got from Robin Giebelhausen. She was having her method students create sort of tutorials like, hi, um, we're gonna be learning this song today. And they had to have like images kind of flash in and demonstration. So it was more like a, a tutorial video. So the first semester I had them do tutorial videos and I'm not even sure that I was making um, videos at that point. So um, then after that, I thought, well, I'm gonna have them make the videos because I want them to know how much time and how challenging it is to make the videos. <laughs> and, and I was amazed because some of them, um, some of them did not change the key. So they found like 
um, the tune online and the tune is in one one key that is great for ukulele and then the audio is not great for ukulele and even though my directions said make sure you check that, that, <laughs> that the audio is in the same key as you know what you've written and if not use you know technology to to change it um it would just amaze me when we would go to play these videos and everybody's kind of because what we would do is i would say make your video and share it with the class and so um your next meeting is starting in five minutes oh is that for me or is that for you i don't think that's for me it, it might you know what be for it you. might be, yeah it might be google sometimes i put in my calendar like don't forget to do this so i don't have a meeting I just, okay all right I, I i was gonna say if you've got to go mm. you, you know no i don't um, i just <laughs> wait don't I, sound mad about that or sad about it. well i just okay. mean you know i gotta pick up a ukulele from the shop that's another story but okay <laughs> that's one thing on my list of things to do today um anyway so so it amazed me like how um the little mistakes and things that they would make and i would say like okay so what was great about that video and what would be if you're a student in this teacher's class what would be more beneficial that sort of thing so um so that was part of that methods class then i stopped doing that methods class um and in the elementary general music methods course i don't have to make a video because they're already doing so much if my students are watching this right now you know how much you're already doing so i didn't want to add something new um but I did start doing summer courses for practicing teachers and for our graduate students, um, like a weekend workshop on ukulele. And so we um, work on our ukulele skills and then we work on um, sort of um, pedagogical supports, like what are the supports you wanna build in? And as part of that course, they make a video. And so, um, so that, that's something else. Many of my students will make one video and then that's it. But I've had some students like Grace, Dobler, who is just a magical person. Um, she is um, student teaching right now. And um, so she started making these videos, you know, a couple semesters ago uh, when she started kind of uh, when she took that summer weekend workshop. And then she just goes above and beyond, which um, if you're looking for someone to hire in your district, Grace would be amazing. Um, but she, um, so she's made those videos and she has said like, Dr. Reese, do you have a list of videos? Because, you know, sometimes I've got extra time and I could just start chipping away at your list of videos. And I'm like, sounds great because yes, I do have a list of, <laughs> of requests and things like that. So, um, so she's made them. Um, who else? Oh, um, we started a community, uh, Fredonia Ukulele Club at the university. So not only do we have these community ukulele jams in Fredonia, we also have the um, ukulele club, which um, one of the music therapy students started. She was um, a student in one of my classes, um, the early childhood music class. And she also started coming to the, a lot of the college students were coming to the community jams. And so she approached me and said, I think as a freshman, she approached me and said, I want to start a ukulele club. Would you be the faculty sponsor? And I was like, sure, that sounds great. What do I have to do to be a faculty sponsor? And basically you just have to sign forms. So I thought I can sign forms. <laughs> um, so, so they um, they use our ukuleles that, that we had for the community group um, and for that I have through the university. Does that make sense? So, um, and she has been a wonderful, Alexia um, is, um, Lekos. She is a music therapy major. She's doing her internship right now, but she has even gone to um, music therapy conferences and done sessions on using ukulele. So um, she is a definite go-getter out there. We, we are so lucky to have all these great students. Um, and she actually has a website about using ukulele in therapeutic contexts. And I think I can give you that too. She does arrangements too of oh, cool. um, ukulele stuff because She's also worked with the New Horizons group. So now that um, ever since this all kind of started, um, a ukulele group has started with the New Horizons band that we have at our university. So um, there's, again, this is such a small community, but it's so rich in opportunities. Um, we're really lucky. And I don't think, um, so I did my PhD in Philadelphia at Temple University. I don't think, I think because it's such a big community there, I don't think I would have felt comfortable or it just that I don't think I would have been able to do what I've been able to do um, with the community, the ukulele group, if I was there, like the small community 
made me feel like I can sort of take this chance and start this small group. And, um, and like I said, the community has really embraced it. So, um, so I'm lucky, but it's, it's not difficult. You don't have to be an expert to start a community ukulele group. You just have to put an ad in the paper. That's what I found. Um, <laughs> put an ad in the paper and they'll, they'll come. It's sort of like people field of green. found it too. They found the ad in the paper. They did. There, there is so much. The paper is very strong and uh, paper is strong with Fredonia. <laughs> and, um, and I think I also ran a couple like beginner classes at the library that helped too. Oh, we have ukuleles at our public library that people can check out. And all I did um, about a year or so into this community ukulele group, I saw a Smithsonian magazine article about um a community in Pennsylvania that had ukuleles at their library. And so I went to the, the community ukulele jam and I said, wow, I just read this article about a community that supports music so much. They have ukuleles at their public library. I wish we had ukuleles at our public library. It would probably only cost about, you know, $60 per ukulele to get, you know, a couple there. It'd be awesome to have like four or five of them. By the end of that two hour jam session, we had enough money to buy ukuleles for the library. People just came up to me with checks. Wow. Yeah, so that was pretty fantastic too. Um, so it, it, again, it's a great community. And I think I live by the motto, what act first, apologize later. So, and I don't often think that deeply about what's involved in what I do. I just sort of leap. Um, and I would encourage you to people who are watching to leap every once in a while. Um, cause people will be there to catch you and it's, um, less scary than you think. So leap and see what happens. You can always apologize later. <laughs> you know? That's that's great advice. And by the way, everything you're doing though, there's nothing harmful for other people. Everything you're doing is is positive based, you know. So <laughs> well, I mean, you know, everything, everything's building up. My own fun story with with your videos was when they originally when I originally was teaching ukulele, and this is right about the same time that you're starting the Fredonia ukulele group. I'm looking at them just going, "Oh man, there it's not teaching music reading." I was very hesitant to use them. I didn't want to use them. And it's all tied to, again, that community group and going and seeing ukulele in practice. But when I realized that in the real world, people aren't freaking out about music literacy with ukulele. It's more about experiential, you know, situations. Um, I had to move off of my point. So some of my first videos were actually <laughs> moving, moving musical notes across the screen with chords, with an embedded track, because I was trying to still tie down a music literacy. And I've, I've since left that. And that doesn't mean to me that music literacy doesn't, isn't important. And it's the same for you, I'm sure, right. that music literacy still counts. But I do so much other stuff. I don't know if you know Dale Duncan um, and his approach to sight reading. If you yeah. haven't, check him out sometime. It's the S-Cube sight reading method. And he's come across this this method based on his own idea of how to teach sight reading um, through relationships and through a game and some other things versus the traditional way we teach sight reading. And I still do that stuff with my choir. So I, I don't feel like I'm leaving them with a, with a hole in their experience. But when it comes down to ukulele and there is a generational divide, how kids look at ukulele is different than how adults do. Adults see it as very uh, community based and kids see it is very YouTube based. I don't know if that makes sense, but mm -hmm. but there's like this, I don't know what your college kids are, are like when they show up and, and how, if that maybe is just a shift where they become more social in the college age, I don't know. But it is it has been really something to see how kids, when like when you're using the ukulele play along videos in your classroom, kids just wanna play music that they know and wanna sing along to it. And and there's they're fooled into singing. Hmm. You know, mm -hmm. which, by the way, goes back to Robin Giebelhausen, which my question for you is, how did you run into to Robin? And Robin has a iBook out there. I'm not yeah. sure if it's in any other format. That's yes, it is. The materials are also in. Um, so if you go to the, the Philip Tamarino, his, you can do it. Yeah. He's got a Ming. website. 
Yeah, you can do it. Um, he's got the website with supporting materials, and I think he has a link to her materials in a non iBook format. So, but she takes the basic same ideas that you teach with, but just always does it with, you know, ukulele and singing perspective versus actual recording. If that makes sense, I mean, that's that's really the shift. Otherwise, it's it's very similar in the approach. But where did you first run into her? I know that you both did a presentation on the topic, which kind of led to your video, right? Is that how that all, like the video, how to make the videos? Is that? Oh, um, no. So uh, Robin and I, um, along with Nate Cruz, Cruz, there, there's like an Adam Cruzy, there's Nate Cruz, um, Nate Cruz <laughs> at, um, and then I, uh, he's in Ohio. It's a university. Jill, why aren't you remembering it? Memory. So anyway, so Nate and Robin and I did a presentation at the College Music Society. Um, they're one of their conferences out in um, New Mexico. So um, we did the presentation from three different perspectives. So. I was doing it sort of from my community music perspective. She was doing it from her school music um, pre-service teacher perspective. And Nate had his um, perspective. He did research. Um, he's got a great research study about. Oh, well, I just lost you there for a second. So he's got another great research study. So, um, so we uh, did a presentation on that just to sort of share our the different ways that we have used ukulele and things like that. Um, but the video about how to make videos um, that I created came from a presentation I did at the NISMA conference, the New York State School Music Association Winter Conference. This was a while back. And... Um, and I put that together because I thought to see the presentation is one thing, but the teachers aren't going to have computers there with them. So it's like I did the presentation, shared the video as a way to say this video is going to be up on my YouTube channel and here's a link to it. So later you can watch it while making your video. Because some people, and I wrote down, I also have a handout that goes step by step by step through everything that I say in the um, video. Because some people learn by reading and some people learn by watching. And um, so I shared that um, presentation a couple of years back. I can't remember what year, but, um, and I think um, Chris, Chris was also, was in the audience for that presentation. I don't, you mean me? No, not you. No, no. Um, Oh, who am I think? Chris with a K. Uh, you already have her on your. Um, oh, Chris Gilbert. Yeah, Chris Gilbert. So okay, she was yes. she was in the audience, I think, for that presentation, um, which is kind of cool. Um, so I think that's when she started doing her stuff on making videos. Was you know after seeing that. So um, and I think to myself like this is great because and I'm so glad you're making videos because I can't be everywhere and I can't make every video so thank goodness other people are interested in sharing um, these ideas because I just can't be everywhere so so I'm glad that they are taking these ideas and running with them um, so that so I met Robin sort of through Michigan State University so she has. Um, a degree or two from Michigan State University, and I have my undergraduate degree from there and taught in the community for a while. So, and she is also does a little bit of music learning theory and she does early childhood. So, um, we crossed paths so many different places and ways. Her stuff is amazing, her stuff is so great. Um, her iBook, and um, she has such a fun personality too she's very kind of zany i'll say and um <laughs> so she she's a lot of fun and i i like i was saying before i think a drawback of these videos is if you don't go off the screen with your students i think you are um they're gonna have a hole so um so i encourage you to, to use some of these videos but then to also use robin's sort of off the page materials um, cause not only 
are you preparing them to engage and learn in different ways? Um, but there are a lot of different learners in your classroom. And for some of your learners, um, this is going to work. And for some of your learners, that's going to work. So we want to prepare our students to um, work in a wide variety of contexts. That's our goal is to help them be independent. And I think if you only use these videos, you're giving them some independence, but you're also building in some dependence. So um, I'm working, working on an article about the benefits and dangers of play along videos. Um, Cause I think it's, I think if you are not aware of some of the dangers, like a tool is great, but it can also be misused. And so I think sometimes these, these videos are great tools, but um, beware, don't misuse them. Boy, so. now, now when, when can we expect to see that article? I don't know, Chris. <laughs> I'm working on it right now. I'm, I'm currently on sabbatical. I've got a lot of projects that I'm working on, but that that's one that sort of um, bubbled up during this process. So I'm really, I'm really interested to see. I don't want, you, I don't want you to give away anything. So I'm oh, just well, good. Then I won't. But um, but. <laughs> I, I really, in fact, maybe what we do is we just, if this works out for you, maybe we just set up another one of these and we talk about the article after it's published. How about that? That would be great. That would be really great. Yeah. For so sure. I was going to be, I, I hope this doesn't tip into that article, but the one other thing that I really want to make sure I talk to you about was, do you have any suggestions for best practice of use of these videos, being that you're really the first person to use them as, as you kind of created the genre, which I mean, is pretty amazing to me as it goes. What, what do you see as best practice? Are, are there any tips that you would give to either teachers or groups or individuals that want to use them, how, what would you say? And then maybe even without giving away too much, what would you, what extra fiber would you give to that diet to help avoid some of the pitfalls without going into your whole article? Well, a lot of what we do is chord accompaniment based and not really melodic based. So it'd be great if teachers also did melody. However, um, you know, we've got recorders and sometimes teachers think, well, the recorder is the melodic instrument and um, the ukulele can be like chordal accompaniment instrument. So I can understand that perspective too. We only have so much time in the day. I understand that. Um, but I don't know if I had all the time in the world, I guess I would also do melodic stuff. I just um, was introduced and I guess not really just introduced, but there's Again, names always kind of escape me, but there's um, a guy who does books, and there's this little chihuahua. Oh, yeah, James Hill. James Ukulele Hill. Ukulele in the classroom. Yeah. That's right. Um, so that stuff's really great, too. That stuff has more standard notation. Yes. And so, um, so I mean, if that's a route you want to go, NAFME says that notation can take many forms, and that, that is so true. And there are so many great musicians who don't read a lick of standard notation, you know? So we need to recognize that although standard notation was a great tool for us when we went through as music majors and all that stuff, not everybody's a music major. And for not all of our students will music notation be the um, gateway through which they get to music, but it's going to be a barrier that keeps, that disconnects them from music. So um, I think notation is great. I also think that there is so much beyond that. I mean, um, you were talking about sight reading techniques. It would be really wonderful. I mean, how often do we say, and this, this I get from Ed Gordon's music learning theory stuff. How often do we say, um, oh, I just started a book. It's called Uneducated. I don't know if you've heard of that book, but it's a memoir about a, a woman who was not exactly homeschooled. But anyway, um, I don't <laughs> say to someone, hey, I got this new book. I'm sight reading it. <laughs> I say, I got this new book. I'm reading it. Reading it. it. Okay, so why do we say sight reading uh, when it comes to music? Why don't we just prepare our students to read? I think for so many of us, um, notation is, is a barrier and it's something that has to be translated because we learn to decode as opposed to learning how to read. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I think the, the auditory, your auditory skills are so important and to um, sometimes we privilege notation um, 
more, we, we give it higher status than maybe it really needs as far as being able to participate meaningfully in making music. Um, yes, notation is one tool, um, but I don't think it's the most important tool. But it does make us feel important because we can read it and not everybody can read it. So it makes us feel like there's a specialized skill. However, um, you know, it separates, it separates people from feeling like they're musicians. I can't read music. I'm not a musician. Well, you know, there are lots of musicians who don't read music. Um, I can't remember what my point was. Um, like how we got just, here. But, well, just best practice. Oh, best what? practices. So I would encourage teachers if they if they're so inclined to use the videos. But wouldn't it be cool if we also provided? And I'm not saying that you should, Chris. But um, if we had a bazillion hours, wouldn't it be great if we um, did the same videos and only did the letter name of the chords and not the chord picture? Okay. And then wouldn't it be great if we did the same video? and we didn't put any of the chords in there so basically just having we had the picture of the song with the words and the um letter names above the words and the recording but we didn't have any pointers okay you see how i'm like pulling away the um training wheels bit by bit so that's kind of what i would encourage to teachers encourage teachers to do is like okay use this video but once the students once they're familiar with it, then pull some of the training wheels away. You know, okay, great. So we um, somehow, I don't know how you could do this, but somehow cover maybe on the projector where the chords are. And so you've got the letter names, like that would be really cool. Um, pulling away those training wheels bit by bit, I think would be helpful for your students then to gain even more independence. Um, because, you know, it, it's one thing to have to see the picture. It's another thing to know when the chord changes. That's a really important thing. Um, so maybe, so maybe that's a route. I don't know. Um, those are some ideas that I've been playing with because again, they're gonna be, they're gonna come in contact with tunes they wanna play. And if there isn't a video, could they play it along with the, the sheet? Um, have students, Take the song sheet and um, you know learn a tune, and then sh and then have them teach another group. So maybe have small groups of students learning different tunes, and then two, maybe if they're in groups of four, two of the students from that group go to the group on the right. So everybody rotates. So they've got two new students in the group. So these two students now have to teach the two new students who come in, like that sort of thing. So they're teaching each other. Um, those are just some things that I would play with. Um, I would also, another thing that I've done with students is I have given them the pictures and the chords on like flashcards for a tune and tell them which chord we start on and then play that chord all the way through even like the change and to say like, okay, so raise your hand when you think we should change to another chord. Just identify when, when that chord is no longer useful and the chord that we're on is no longer, <laughs> doesn't fit. If they can tell that, that's a really good starting point, right? And then to say, okay, so now let's look at our flash chord cards. Which chord should we change to? Should we change to the F? Should we change to the G? Which one? Okay, so let's try switching to the F. Well, that sounded funny. Okay, so let's try the G. Which one of those sounds better? You know, like that would be a beneficial skill um, for the students to have. And you can do that in sort of a game um, format too. Um, another thing that I think would, that my the people in my group struggle with is um, here's a familiar song. The chord starts on C. Does the tune start on the tonic? Does it start on a note that's not the tonic? You know, that is really tough for the people that I work with. It's like, okay, so I know the chords for Itsy Bitsy Spider, but what note do we start singing on? That's a great question. And that is hard for some people to figure out. And I go back to my music learning theory training. It's like, um, does the song start on the resting tone or the tonic or does it start in something different? If it starts on something different, you know, how do we find that something different? And these are all things that 
we that students need so much more than learning how to read notation. You know, and it's I, do you guys use the yellow book or the blue book in? So the um, daily ukulele. Yeah, the daily. Do you use that in your group? That's so many ukulele groups use that as their de facto, but that one always shows you the starting note. On, it and, does. You know, and where it's at, it, and that seems to help people out a little bit. It does, and but can people? hear the note on their ukulele and then sing it with their voice is another skill. Yeah, absolutely. Right? <laughs> Especially if you've got someone who is trying to sing the absolute pitch of the ukulele and that's not in their range or right. they can't do the octave displacement and not everybody can. Um, so again, these are skills that, boy, if our students develop that skill as uh, a school music student, that they could definitely use that in the future. Um, no, we don't use daily ukulele okay. or the daily ukulele leap year because we, we do so much the videos okay. and I, I send my folks a, um, I have sent, I don't always do this when I have time, I send them, um, like a survey that says, what tunes do you want on our jam session? Um, because I, it's important for them. I always try to kind of feel out like we, who's at the jam sessions. And I try to do a mix of like current tunes and past tunes and, and favorites that my group has. Um, so that's kind of how I choose the literature that we're going to, the tunes that we're going to play at the jam session. Um, so the books we have pulled from only for like, um, sing-alongs at Christmas. Okay. But um, I could definitely say, and like I said, we don't do a lot of acapella. That's something, acapella, I get uh, Not a company. A, a video. No vid aca <laughs> Stan's video. Um, but that's something that I'd love to do. I would love to also do um, open mic as part of my group. Again, I have a full-time job. And it's only me. I was just um, talking to, I just visited the Austin Ukulele Society group. Um, and Jen and Bob are amazing. They're so amazing. And they do so much. And there's so many opportunities for ukulele in their community. Um, and I think it helps that there's two of them running this group. A challenge that I have is um, it's me. And whenever I've asked for help for my group, people are really interested in participating but they're not, not interested leading. in taking something else on. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And, and leading a group is also a set of skills and dispositions and personality traits. And so um, recently I've had um, one of the group members offer to lead while I've been out gallivanting and doing these workshops places. And, um, and that's been, that's been working well too, but um, it sort of takes you know, it takes a certain kind of person to run these groups and certain kind of know-how. And um, so I would love to diversify and well, I'd love to do four jam sessions uh, a month. That would be great. But again, I have a job. <sighs> well, the, twin, the twin Cities guy, there's a guy in the Twin Cities. He runs three jams a week. Oh, my gosh. And he's I just, I don't know how you would do it. independently wealthy? No, but he's, he's... Did he marry for money? No, retired. He's, My third marriage is going to be for money. That's what I've decided. The next time I get married, it's going to be for money. <laughs> Don't tell my current husband. That. I know. That'd be awful. Yeah. No, I've okay. said it to him before. <laughs> oh, man. But at, at least he knows. This time I married for love. So, oh, I mean, he's got to really feel good great. about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. I mean, we're already past, well past an hour um, it's just you a pleasure to visit two podcasts with you. for the price of one from this, if you'd like, I guess, you know, I guess, you well, know. I'll part just one, it, part two, I'll put it all as one people can, can pause or whatever. But I mean, obviously if we ever, if I was ever in the New York area, I'll call you up and, and we can get coffee somewhere and just visit. Cause there's just so much to learn and, um, just, you've brought so much and there's so much depth to your, your thinking through this process. And I, I can't wait to see these articles that you're, working on so now you're going to feel some pressure there to do that i do feel pressure and i would just want everybody to know that it's it's not for lack of trying um but it takes so long the publication process is just takes so long and that's i think part of the reason that robin um very generously 
um, has this iBook that she has self-published and um, and just lets go for for the price of nothing because she really does believe that um, teachers deserve um, thoughtful and musical um, practices and um, and ideas. And so she is she's wonderful to to share that. Um, so like, uh, and a lot of what she has to do and what I have, I have to do is, um, this peer reviewed publication and, um, and that takes a little while. So it, it's funny. There are all these, I'm sure there are all these ideas out there. Robin has great articles too in, um, um, general music, general music today. I think she's got a couple ukulele articles out. So, and I think that is freely available. I don't, I don't even, maybe you have to be an AFME member. You might have to be an AFME member. Yeah, I can look that up too. Yeah, but but that's not, you know, and it's not, it's practical. Uh, and she writes very clearly. So um, those are great articles. Um, lots of lots of good stuff. So so it probably will take a little while. But um, <laughs> that's, a, that's another reason why we do workshops that we do. So we can share these ideas um, sort of, and, and, and in a way workshop the ideas through the workshop. Um, I learn a lot from practicing teachers. Um, I think it's kind of reciprocal um, when we interact. So that's a now, thing. if people want to contact you, obviously they could do it through a comment on your YouTube channel, and your YouTube channel is youtubecom slash Reese. Okay. Right. That's that's correct. <laughs> I just I Google it whenever I have to go to it myself. <laughs> I just Google Dr. Jill Reese, and it comes up. So. And it's not like I'm Googling myself all the time. I just Google for the, the YouTube. And then you also have the Fredonia Ukulele Club website. Mm -hmm. And if somebody wants to, to bring you out, like um, you were just down in Austin, how would they go about requesting mm -hmm. you to do that? What's, what's your best process? Do you have a process figured out? Uh, not really. Um, <laughs> just Reese at Fredonia, R E E S E at Fredonia.edu. Just my email address is really the best way to contact me. Um, I also have a like ukulele for music teachers web page too. I don't know if that. That's part of your, your Fredonia website. It's one okay. of the. It, yeah, so there's a link to it um, from there, but it's like its own separate website. But um, okay, good. I'm glad people can get to it from there. That's good. Oh, and blocked, <laughs> blocked videos. YouTube sometimes blocks my videos. And so I've started putting them up on the um, Fredonia ukulele website. So you can still have access to them. So well, it has been a pleasure. I don't want to take any more of your time because you've also got to pick up a, a ukulele. And you, we didn't even hear what that story was about. I do. Yes, I just found it. It's one of my seven ukuleles. And I found it. Student, student, if you, somebody, if you, if you can describe it to me, um, it was left in the computer lab at Fredonia and it was there for a year. I have, I watched that thing kind of ferment there for a year <laughs> before I even opened it up. I opened it up and then I was like, this is a, it looks pretty, right? And so I go to play it and I go to play like a G chord and that is not a G chord because I think some of the frets were just too high. I think maybe at the second fret, second or third fret, it was just the fret was um, too tall. So no wonder someone probably got frustrated and was like, forget this and just left it there. So um, I adopted it and <laughs> took it to the hospital and I have to pick it up today. Um, Carino Music, we've got a lot of good music stores, cool little music shop in Fredonia, shout out and Carino's. <laughs> but Carino, um, they, they took it and have done some repairs on it. And I thought, well, if I'm if I pay X amount, I picked it up for free, paid X amount um, to get it repaired. That's probably worth it, right? So, anyway, so I'm going to pick right. that up today. We well, have to post pictures of it later or something. <laughs> sure. <laughs> have you guys ever done a live broadcast of one of your ukulele jams too? No, we haven't done a live broadcast. I'd be interested in learning about that technology. Would it just be Google Hangouts? Well, I think it's even easier than that on YouTube. I mean, I think you can just use the camera feature. There's a camera button now that you can just hit camera and it'll record it. I oh, think. Okay. I think. All right. So it, it might be worth trying at some point. 
Yeah, I know um, Bob and Jen for the Austin Ukulele Society, they're having an anniversary um, this next jam session and they were talking about, you know, that's something they'd be interested in exploring next. So if you, I, I know you're, this is like for play along video channel. Well, but it's, it's for everything. It's you, I was gonna anything. say, you might run out of people to interview for play alongs. So, um, so Bob and Jen at the Austin Ukulele Society, they're just such wonderful people and they've got a story. So um, they might be people to add to your list. It's always fun to hear stories too, isn't it? It is. Stories are good. I'm a I'm... qualitative researcher at times, and so oh, okay. I love stories. Qualitative research is all about that story. See, all mine was quantitative. I, I made sure that I had numbers to back up on. So Yeah. Numbers are good. I've done P-values, qualitative research. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, with all sincerity, I'm, in fact, my favorite, I don't know if you've ever joined Ukulele Underground, the, the forum. I, maybe I have. It, it sounds familiar. But I started a for, I started a thread some time ago that was how did the ukulele find you, and that that page is now twenty two pages long oh of people gosh. giving their stories and it's kind of fun to just to see how people, you know, the stories are always the best part, which is my favorite part of doing this stuff. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. well, thank you for spending some time with us today. I appreciate it. Thanks for asking me, and um, thank you everybody out there for all that you do for your students and your communities um, using ukulele to. Um, draw out the musician in each person. That's a really important, um, I don't know, uh, not quest, but, um, you know, um, hero's journey of some sort. So, <laughs> so thanks for all that you do. Yeah, and thank you again, Dr. Reese, for everything that you've done too to, to actually create this genre. I mean, it's, it's amazing. And now we've got over 800 videos like this. So it's, I'm, you know, I, I just stumbled onto it. I really, again, most of my um, motivations are purely selfish. So I started the group because I had nobody to play with. I used the videos because I wanted to play and I didn't have the opportunity to do it. So, I mean, luckily, I'm, I'm just lucky that they um, are useful. And I'm glad that they're useful. So, All right. Thanks. Thank you for your time, everybody. And we'll see you in the future with another interview. See you soon. All right. Bye.